Hey, it's Andrew at BTO Range. Uh, we're going to do a little segment here on uh, National Firearms Act uh, stuff and, and dispel a few misconceptions if we can and kind of go over the process of how to deal with acquiring these, uh, depending on where you live, right? Silencer is legal right now, I think 42 states, and most allow uh, short barrel rifles, short barrel shotguns. Some states are more restrictive on uh, the machine guns. Some of, some of this stuff is just unobtainable if you live in certain states like California, New York, things like that. So let's, uh, let's look at a little bit of history of, of the National Firearms Act. 1934 uh, is when it was passed. And it was uh, passed because of all the gangland violence and shootouts and, and whatnot. June 26, actually, 1934 is the effective date. So that established the, the registry of uh, National Firearms Act items. It also established the, uh, the tax required to transfer. It established that tax of $200. And that tax is, is unchanged today. So um, $200 in 1934 is about $5,000 now. So if they'd adjusted that for inflation, you can see that it would still be rather punitive today. So uh, originally, the, and, and a lot of people don't know this probably, originally they had intended to include pistols and revolvers uh, in the National Firearms Act. So if that had been allowed to, to remain part of the bill prior to passage, then you'd have to go through the Form 4 process or the NFA process to buy a revolver or to buy just a standard, uh, just a standard pistol. So fortunately, that uh, was cut out of the bill prior to passage and, and it never came in, in the being. So uh, NFA of 1934 was the first federal gun control laws. There were some state and local gun control laws prior to that but uh, that was the first federal gun control legislation. Prior to that, you could order a Maxim silencer through the mail, or you could order a Thompson machine gun through the mail. And, and they ran ads in Field and Stream and other magazines to, to uh, protect your ranch with a Thompson submachine gun. And those, those ads are pretty cool. So it's been modified a couple times. The Gun Control Act of 1968 modified it to a degree. The, the most significant modification was the, uh, in 1986, May 19th of 1986, the Firearms Owner Protection Act. Did a lot of good things, but it also established or created transferable and then non-transferable machine guns. So machine guns manufactured after May 19th of 1986 uh, cannot be sold to individuals. They, they can be sold to law enforcement agencies or they can be sold to, go, to the government or they can be exported, but they're not uh, transferable to, to non-licensees or non-special operations tax holders. So uh, it created an artificial market. Uh, guns that were selling for $600 prior to May 19th of 1986 sell for sixteen dollars to $20,000 today. So, um, there's only around 175,000 uh, registered machine guns currently. There's probably not going to be any more. It re would require an amnesty period to register machine guns, which is uh, would require Congress, and it, it's doubtful that's going to happen. So a lot of people, are, uh, we hear this a lot at the range when we start talking about silencers and, and whatnot to folks, and we sell them. But uh, folks have a lot of misconceptions about what happens when you register, what happens when you have an NFA item registered to you. The, most, the thing people are, are most concerned about is they believe that ATF can come to your house, come in your house, and go find your registered item. That, that's simply not true. Uh, you do not give up your Fourth Amendment rights when you, when you have a registered NFA item. Now, if they have probable cause, can they get a search warrant? Absolutely, 100% they can. But as far as them showing up and doing an unannounced audit of your items as a private registrant, uh, they simply can't do that. So another misconception is in order for me to get uh, a silencer, I have to have a class three license. No, you don't. We have to have a class three license uh, because we're a dealer you have to buy a tax stamp. It's a one-time $200 tax stamp. Again, that hasn't changed since 1934. The money value hasn't changed. 
So it's a one-time purchase. You don't have to renew it. Uh, it it's not a license at all. So uh, that's just not right. So another thing that we hear is uh, various schemes to avoid registration of silencers. And, and we see that most, uh, most recently, uh, here in Texas anyway, the governor signed legislation that if a silencer was made in Texas and was not transported out of Texas and it didn't require a tax or federal registration and, and look good on paper, the feds simply don't care about that. And, and it's, still, it's still a federal thing, it's still required. Uh, and, and there have been cases in, in, in Kansas with a very similar law where, where people have actually gotten charged and convicted of federal crimes for that. So we're licensed uh, by the ATF, uh, just like any other gun shop would be. So we have to abide by those, those federal laws, regardless of what the state says about whether they will or will not uh, comply with that. And I don't want to get into a political argument. I mean, we run a gun shop in probably the most conservative, one of the most conservative counties in a very conservative state. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out where our politics are, but uh, we have to live in reality. And we're not, just like any other gun shop, any other federal licensee would, would have to comply with those ATF rules in order to stay in business. So let's talk about the different forms. There are five basic ATF forms or NFA type forms that, uh, that you'll hear talked about. So we'll just go in numerical order. The Form 1, ATF Form 1 is for a non-licensee for an individual that's not uh, a special operation, a uh, special occupation taxpayer. So that's an SOT, which is the class three license or class two manufacturer. So uh, form one is if you wanted to build your own silencer or if you wanted to do your own short barreled rifle, it's legal for you to do so federally. Again, state laws may vary, but you have to register it. You have to pay a making tax uh, of that $200 and there are marking requirements and, and uh, all that spelled out precisely what those are, even to the, the dimensions of the marking. So that's what the Form 1 does. As a dealer, we can't do a Form 1 or for an individual. You as a maker have to do that. We, can't do the, we can do the laser engraving and do all that stuff, but uh, that's, that's the form for an individual to make an NFA item. Form 2 is for us as a special occupational taxpayer, as an SOT holder. Uh, we can make short barrel rifles, we can make silencers without having to pay that $200 tax. We still have to have them re they register to us, uh, but uh, we, would, we don't pay that tax because we have that license. We pay a yearly licensing fee to be able to do that. So there's different processing times also here that we need to talk about. The Form 1 currently, and, and this is October of 2023, we're, we're hearing Form 1's come back in a matter of a few weeks. Uh, the Form 2 uh, comes back to us when we manufacture a short barrel rifle or machine gun. The Form 2 comes back in just a matter of a couple of days. So the next form we'll talk about is the Form 3. The Form 3 is a transfer between two special operations uh, SOT holders. So dealers with SOTs can transfer these guns between each other, SOT on both ends, without having to pay that $200 uh, transfer tax. Those uh, take about 7 to 10 days right now. Uh, we're seeing those come back to that. So then the Form 4. The Form 4 is the one that, that deals with uh, an SOT selling or transferring an NFA item to a non-licensee or to an individual. This is a form where if you came to the store and bought a silencer, that's the form that we would do. So that form, uh, it's not that difficult to fill out. Uh, there's many ways to do it. We do ours completely electronically. We have a kiosk in store where we can capture fingerprints electronically. Everything photographed, everything's uploaded. Uh, the, the payment for the $200 tax stamp is done on a, on a uh, pay.gov website. And it's, it's fairly painless and uh, a lot better than it used to be with paper. 
and we're seeing those come back now between five and 11 months. So it, it's still taking a lot longer than uh, you'd think, but uh, five to 11 months is what we're seeing right now. It's October of 23. Now, here's one thing, in order for the tax not to be paid, both ends of the transaction have to be an SOT holder. So if an individual was to sell us a silencer or a short barrel rifle, it would be on a form four, not a form three. And there'd be a $200 transfer tax involved with that. So that does affect how much a dealer is willing to pay for a used silencer or a used SPR or anything of that nature because it, it does factor directly into the cost, obviously, of the item. So. Uh, the Form 4 uh, is the most common, it's one we see the most often. It can be done fully electronically uh, if you have a way to capture your fingerprints electronically. It requires a very specific type of, of file uh, in order to upload and attach to the, to the website, to the government website. It can be done in a hybrid fashion, it can be, the form can be done electronically. The fingerprints can be inked on a specific fingerprint card and followed in with, by mail or the old-fashioned way of doing everything completely uh, on paper is, is still available. It does add uh, a, a some amount of time to the overall transaction time. We strongly suggest people do it electronically if, if at all possible. Uh, there is another, uh, another form, a Form 5. A Form 5 is used if an SOT sells a gun to a government agency or sell the silencer to government agencies it's done on a Form 5. It's a non-taxed transfer. And the Form 5 is also used for um, transfers in probate. So if, um, if you will, if you, if you own a silencer and you will that to a beneficiary and then upon your passing, the executor of your estate would do a Form 5 uh, to that beneficiary. So there, that's a non-tax paid transfer on a Form 5. So there is, and this is another uh, popular misconception, if I die, what happens to my silencers? Well, you can will them to uh, your beneficiaries and it could be done tax-free. Now there is another way to register these things and that is on a gun trust. And there's tons of information out there on the internet on gun trusts and, and lawyers that provide gun trusts and other agencies. But uh, what, what that does is it creates an entity, a business entity, similar to a corporation or an, L or an LLC that would be the actual registrant of the NFA item. So you wouldn't necessarily own it as an individual, the trust would own it. And you as the settler of the trust and any trustees that you name on the trust could be in possession of it. Uh, that said, all the trustees that, that are on the trust initially has to go through the same, they would all have to go through the same uh, fingerprint and photograph process and background check process for the, uh, for the silencer. So uh, it's a little bit more complicated to set up a trust on the front end. On the back end, there's no probate involved. So on the back end, once the settler passes, then the beneficiaries now become available or eligible to be in, in possession of the item. So uh, there's a little bit more work to do on the front end, a little bit easier on the back end. Either way, either way kind of works actually, so it's kind of up to you. So each of those parties has to do a form 5320.23. So ATF loves their form numbers. And uh, basically that's all the yes, no questions that you would find on the 4473 and your identifying information. So all the responsible parties on a trust have to fill out that form, has to be part of the registration package going in. But all that can be done electronically. So um, I know this all sounds very complicated and it's a ton of information, but this is one of those instances where it's actually easier to do it than it is to talk about it. So even though there's a lot of rules and regulations, your dealer should be able to walk you through most of this, uh, if not all of this, and get you through it in, in relatively quick fashion, relatively painless fashion. So um, another, another thing is the notification of the local law enforcement agency. And prior to, I think it was July of, of 2016, yeah, June or July of 2016, prior to that date, you actually had to have your local law enforcement chief, whether it's chief of police, 
county sheriff, district attorney, uh, district court judge, somebody of that nature actually sign off that it was okay for you to have this particular silencer or, or short barrel rifle or whatever. And in many jurisdictions, that just wasn't gonna happen. For example, here in Texas, if you lived in Harris County, Texas, or Tarrant County, Texas, or God forbid, Travis County, Texas, there was no way that that sheriff or, or chief of police of Austin or Dallas or Houston was ever gonna sign off on that for an individual. So um, that went away in June of 2016. It's no longer required. Uh, the trade-off uh, with that was what I talked about earlier, all the responsible parties now had to be background checked and fingerprinted on the front end. So the trade-off of that was now sim simply a notification of the law enforcement, uh, chief law enforcement officer. It's not a, a, they don't have veto power, I guess. So that opened up a lot of opportunities for people that once were restricted just from where they lived uh, by some pure bureaucratic decision. Now they could actually own these things. So that was helpful. So it, is, it no longer requires the, uh, the chief of police or, or sheriff to check off on it. It's simply a notification and quite honestly, I believe that most of these sheriff's departments, when they get these uh, these things in the mail, they, they, they don't, they're not required to do anything with them. There's no federal requirement for them to store them. There's no anything. They just get round filed anyway, uh, what most of them have told us. So um, the process itself. So what ATF will do when they get this packet, whether electronically or by mail, is they're going to ship those fingerprints over to FBI. They're going to make sure that you're you, that the fingerprint matches the, uh, the form information, and assuming that's correct, they'll do the same NICS background check that we do uh, over the counter as, as a dealer. So the big difference here is that as a dealer on a non-NFA firearm, if you go to a delayed status on your NICS background check after three business days, the dealer can, not must, but can, go ahead and continue the transaction or continue the transfer of the firearm uh, without a definitive answer from FBI on the background check. ATF will not do that. ATF must have a proceed response on that next background check in order to proceed. So if you get delayed when you, uh, when you fill out a, a form over the counter for a pistol or shotgun or rifle, then you need to probably resolve why you're getting delayed before you apply for a silencer just to save yourself frustration in the long term. Because what happens on the delay is uh, the FBI NICS will reach out to whatever agency has posted whatever information that's caused the delay. And sometimes they just don't get back to them or they don't get back to them anytime soon and FBI Next is not going to follow up and hound them about, hey, you know, we sent in this background check on John Smith uh, four months ago, we hadn't heard anything. I mean, that's not gonna happen. So eventually ATF will give up on it and they'll return the Form 4 disapproved or, or uh, without action uh, just by an unresolved background check. So that said, you get your $200 tax stamp back but you don't get your NFA item. So if, you, if you're the person that for whatever reason, get, not a prohibited person, but you get delayed, then uh, find out why you can get your FBI, you can get your FBI records yourself and then get with whatever agency has put whatever report on there and try to get that resolved prior to starting this process. You'll be a lot easier, uh, be a lot easier on the long run. So how do you get the tax stamp back? It depends on how you filed it. So if it was done by mail, prior to the whole e-forms thing, uh, we would get the dealer, not you, the dealer would get the, uh, the second copy of the form back in the mail with an actual physical big postage stamp stuck to it, a $200 postage stamp. And that would be your tax stamp. So now electronically, that's done by email, both the dealer and the registrant, you and me, would get the email at the same time that, hey, here's your tax stamp. It'd be a PDF copy of the form with that tax stamp attached to it. So that becomes your tax stamp. So what do you do with that? Well, um, keep the original in a safe place. Uh, print one, keep it in wherever you keep your deeds and titles. And just keep one wherever the, regist wherever the registered item goes. It's a good idea to have one with you. Um, in the event you don't have one, 
can can it be figured out? Yeah, but you know, how much time will that take to figure out, and how much problem will you go through? You know, if someone wants to be a jerk about it. Which brings us to kind of the last point: When do you have to show your tax stamp? So you have to show your tax stamp if ATF asks you for your tax stamp. That's that's part of the requirement, and and I would extend that just as a common sense thing to other law enforcement. So if you get stopped hunting in a state where you're eligible to hunt with silencers and, and the game warden says, hey, do you have a tax stamp? It's a good idea to have one, even if you show it to them electronically on the phone. Um, where you don't have to show your tax stamp is at the gun range. Uh, we don't typically ask for a tax stamp if you come in to shoot a, a silenced gun. Um, we're going to assume you have it. We don't have law enforcement requirement or authority to do anything with it. Now that said, um, if, a, if a gun range has a policy to where if you're there you have to show the tax stamp or you can't shoot, they can certainly tell you you can't shoot without a tax stamp. They're within the rights to do so. Uh, and then it's up to you whether you want to continue doing business there or not. It's completely your decision, but um, they can't take your silencer. They can't do anything like that. There's no uh, law enforcement authority to do that. So. Uh, that said, if you have an unregistered silencer uh, that you made because it's a mate in Texas silencer, uh, if it's an unsafe looking silencer, in other words you made it out of an oil filter or it's one of those solvent trap things, probably not going to let you shoot it. Uh, not from a registration standpoint, but simply from a safety standpoint because those things do tend to come apart sometimes and we don't, you know, we don't want you hurt on, on, or anyone else hurt. Uh, because of that. So once your tax stamp is approved uh, and you, we either get it electronically or we get it in the mail, you show up at your dealer and there's one last thing to do and you have to fill out the 4473 form, the standard over-the-counter uh, gun form, and that just finalizes the transfer of the silencer to you. There's no further background check to do. That's all been done. Uh, and, and that's it. And, and I know it sounds like a, a whole bunch and it's, it, you, some of you are probably thinking, man, there is no way now I'm going to even try uh, to do that. That's just way too complicated. And it's really not. Um, there's a little bit, uh, depending on how many people you have on the trust, it can be a little cumbersome to get four, five, six people through the fingerprint and, and photograph thing. So, I mean, that's, that's one, possible issue, one possible issue, but in all, in all honesty, it's not all that difficult and it, it's not, the most frustrating part is having to wait for the, uh, for the silencer to, or the Form 4 paperwork to get approved. That's where most people find it frustrating. And they'll call, they'll call the store and say, hey, what's going on with my tax stamp? Say, hey, I have no idea. You know, we submitted it back on November 24th of 2022 or whatever the date was, and we haven't heard back from them. So, I mean, and that said, You'll have the serial number, you'll have the ATF control number of the form. You can call the NFA branch of ATF and say, hey, what's going on with this serial number or this? And unfortunately, they're not going to tell you, oh, yeah, Brenda's got it on her desk and she's, you know, you got three ahead of you. It's not to that degree. They'll tell you it's in process or it's been approved or it's been disapproved. That's really what you're going to hear. So. That, that's the most frustrating part, and, and people do tend to get a little bit fed up with that. It is better than it used to be. There for a while it was 18 months, you know, and it's better than that. When, uh, when ATF started this e-forms thing again, they said 90 days, and that lasted for about two days. And, and now it's, now it's uh, back up to anywhere between five and 11 months is what we're seeing. So the bottom line is don't be, uh, don't shy away. Uh, from NFA stuff. Uh, once you start shooting things with silencers on them, you're not going to want to shoot it any other way. Uh, it's kind of like potato chips in that regard, I guess. You just can't have just one. They, get, they do become addictive. Uh, if you're in a state that doesn't allow silencer ownership, uh, one of those few states, yeah, it's, it's, you're missing out. I mean, I don't know what else to tell you, but uh, it, it, it's probably one of the coolest things ever to be able to, to shoot this type of stuff with a silencer on or to have that short barrel rifle. And if you like investment uh, stuff and you have the means to do so, uh, those 175,000 and change transferable machine guns are probably some of the best blue chip gun investments you could ever make because uh, they're not going to be anymore. And as attrition starts taking those 
out as that number starts to to go down further the value is just going to keep going up so uh, it's a good field of gun stuff to get into uh, it's it's certainly uh, realistic and it's, it's not it's not terribly financially uh, a financial problem at least as far as Salinster goes and, and the $200 tax stamp uh, in 1934 it was but it's more of a nuisance now than it, than it was in 34 uh, money wise anyway so uh, if you're going to do it go ahead and get it done uh, the sooner you start the sooner that wait will be over with obviously so uh, get a hold of your local NFA dealer and go check it out Hopefully this was informative. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments. We'll try to uh, we'll try to get to them. But once again, appreciate uh, appreciate your time. Like and and subscribe to our channel. We put out we try to put out a ton of good stuff for you at least weekly. So thanks again. Have a great day.